Hello everybody, um, my name is Craig McKellar. Um, I head up the business here at Radico um, and I've been with the company for around a year. Um, before I start with the important bits, can I, can I just do a little check that, that everybody here can, can hear correctly? If, if you can, if you can just type in a, a quick hi or something like that, that might be useful just to make sure I'm not missing anybody out. Okay, well that, that's great. I just wanted to check that I'm not going to be speaking away and nobody can hear me. So that's good. The technology is there. That's brilliant. Um, it, just uh, to, to follow on a little bit more of a background of myself, um, I previously, previously worked in a variety of roles within primarily the energy and sustainability sector within consultancies. I've also worked for a few multinational companies, so I, I have a bit of an understanding of the complexity that sometimes there can be when working for, for a, a company that's, that's spread over such a large geographical area, and, and, and so hopefully we can discuss a little bit around that as well. Um, other than work, I guess my, my main interests are motorbikes, tennis, and hill walking, but I'll, I'll leave it at that because I could talk for five hours on that, and I know our time is, is very restricted. Um, so, if I now move on to uh, the formal presentation, um, okay, first thing I really want to talk about is um, a, a little bit around our history, who we are and, and, and where we've came from. An organization, as the name suggests, Redico, we've been founded by a Dr. Michael Reddy, um, an eminent psychologist in the UK. He previously founded an organization called ICAS. ICAS was an employee assistance program organization. Basically what that means, those that haven't come across them, is it's a telephone-based outsourced service to major companies for employee counseling and confidential advice service. So it's really a, a, a health and well-being service for large organizations. Uh, a very successful company, which was bought by the insurance company AXA in 2006. Um, and then Dr. Reddy took a couple of years to, to work out what he wanted to do next. Effectively, he had been working within a very narrow area of, of employees and employee behavior and wanted to do something that instead of just dealing with the symptoms, addressed the root causes of, of some of the problems that they were having at, um, that they were having to deal with at ICAS. And that's why Redico was created, originally as a company called Human Potential Accounting, and really to expand into the wider services and to, to, to make uh, happier, healthier employees, but as importantly, to make more productive employees as well. It's uh, all based around the principles of human capital management, which is what I'm here to really talk about today. Um, and the next slide, as you can see, will explain a little bit about what human capital management is and what our mission is. Effectively, we believe that better behaved organizations are better performing organizations and that the short term behaviors of employees lead to long term cultures within organizations. So it's important to set in place a framework that encourages the positive types of behaviors and eliminates those and doesn't tolerate the negative behaviors. Again, one of the key fundamentals of human capital management, which we'll discuss in more depth later, is that it's important that this focus has to be on measurable things and not just on feel good gut instinct. So what does this really entail in terms of, of, of our services? Well, there's a very brief overview of our services. Um, I'll go into these in a little more depth later on. Um, if anybody has any questions, obviously they can come up in, in the chat box there. It would probably be best if we, we leave them to the end, but uh, obviously we'll welcome any, any questions at the end and we'll try and answer any of those questions that we've got really. So the key services there are conflict management services, training, assessment and audit, consultancy services, and then executive search. Now, we are uh, a fairly small team centrally. We're based in the UK, but we do have a large network of over 200 consultants within the UK. Um, our UK-based consultants have got a variety of skills, ranging from uh, very 
soft psychological skills all the way through to bigger organization development experience and then particularly in our investigations area uh, people that are specialist in their own country's employment law uh, and the legal implications that, that come with managing and employing people we also deliver global solutions to our customer base that's either through technology either web or phone based delivery of services but equally, we now have uh, an, an expanded global network of consultants um, based on all continents. I don't think we're in the Antarctic yet, but I'm ambitious to get there. Um, and we have the ability and expertise of, of traveling throughout those continents. To give you an overview of, of where we are, um, the, the areas of, of orange showing up on, on the screen at the moment, they're where we've physically got consultants in place. Um, but we do have and have worked with other customers throughout the world and use them as a base. Okay, human capital management. A little bit more about human capital management. It, it's a strange term and often when I talk to people about human capital management, it seems a slightly impersonal term as well. People often at first glance think of human capital management as, as quite a harsh way of dealing with people. Um, but it links into to a, a well-known saying in the UK, which I think is, is a fairly global saying, and that is that, that people are a company's greatest asset. Um, and whether or not that's just a cliche or whether it's a, a fundamental truth. Well, I guess the answer to that question really depends on the way an organization behaves. It's not necessarily what an organization says, but it's the way it behaves from top down and how it treats its people and how it treats its human capital. If we look at uh, how, how your people can be uh, your greatest asset, your competitors, they can copy your IT systems, they can undercut your prices, um, but matching your greatest staff and your most talented people, that's really the hardest bit. So treating your people as a capital asset is, is a very good thing and we'll explain how that is really. First of all, if we look at how businesses typically manage an asset, um, as you're all aware, I'm sure, but assets are comprehensively reported on. Um, there's a lot of information shared about the assets. An asset is seen as a competitive advantage, just like we've talked about um, there. Also, more importantly, assets are invested in and there's a commitment from board level down towards those assets. Um, and, and what makes an asset different and why it's important really from, from our methodology to call a human capital management as opposed to people, but that those investment decisions are based upon a very measurable return on investment. So for example, if you were to spend a thousand pounds training a, a member of staff, it's, it's important to understand the return on that investment you'll get. Will you get uh, extra productivity greater than the thousand pounds? A reduced risk of cost greater than the thousand pounds? This is this is really where human capital management makes itself different from other areas of, of dealing with people. So now, if we look at how an average business treats its people, most organisations, particularly within Europe, tend to have human resource departments, HR departments. Um, what does this really say about how people are actually managed? Well, the first thing, if you take it at, at face value, it means that people are not viewed as capital assets, but they're viewed as a resource. And if we look at how businesses manage their resource, well, they're, they're seen purely as a cost, at best as a commodity. Um, if you think of the resources that you have within your business, whether it's paper, light bulbs, or as a wider world, things like coal, they're there as, as things that you just use up and just they're to be replaced when they, they no longer have any use. They're, there's no real competitive advantage. One light bulb is exactly the same as another light bulb, so that makes one person exactly the same as another person. Um, so really, does the average business treat their people as a greatest asset if they look at their people as a resource? And this is where we believe that human capital management has got better benefits for an organization than, than the traditional way of dealing with people. So breaking down what human capital management is, there are five key factors 
within human capital management. These are the key areas that we look to first of all measure, get an understanding of where an organization currently is in terms of, of their maturity, and then we can identify the areas that are most in need uh, of improvement or show the greatest potential um, to develop the organization and the people within it. If I start from right to left, we start at well-being. That, that's very much the original business of, of, of ICAST that Dr. Reddy started, very much focused on the well-being. Um, the, the key there is, is about ensuring that employees are happy and healthy, both physically and mentally healthy, um, and at its very basic, that an organization that they work for isn't contributing to people being less happy, being less healthy. If we then move on to the, the next area, which is talent, talent, I guess, could be better described as potential. It's not just about your top performers within an organization. It's about looking at the entire organization, the people that are within that organization, and seeing how close they are to achieving their individual potential, and seeing whether that's something that the individual can address through training and development, or whether it's on a wider organization, uh, in terms of is that the right person in the right role or do their strengths perhaps suit another role within the organization. The next area is, is risk. I guess as well as people being the greatest asset a company has, they can also be the greatest potential risk that a company has. Uh, people are unpredictable. People can often sometimes be emotional, malicious. Um, it's important for an organization to make sure that it manages the risk that people in, uh, entail within the organization. That's both within the policies and procedures that it has in place, but more importantly, in the way that it deals and motivates with people. And by looking after the well-being and the talent and providing the right leadership, providing a good environment for, for, for that people risk to be minimized and eliminated. The next one really is leadership. Um, leadership really is, is, we've talked really about the behaviors of an organization from the bottom upwards. Leadership is now the behaviors of an organization from the top down. It's very easy for an organization to talk about what it wants to do, how it wants to behave, but it's really the importance is about how the leadership sets that tone and how that leadership behaves. It's also there about understanding the leadership team and making sure that that's uh, seen as a unit and, and not just as a series of individuals. Um, we can work very closely with our, our clients to make sure that the leadership is seen as a unified team that's stronger than the, than the sum of its individual parts. Another part which is important, which is the opposite of leadership, which a lot of organizations forget, is the importance of what we call followership. Um, not everybody within an organization can be a leader. Not everybody within an organization should be a leader. Um, if you have an organization that's entirely full of leaders, you tend to have a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, not a lot of action. So it's important to identify those people that are naturally followers and that do respond to good, clear, consistent leadership uh, and reward and encourage those people. It's, it's, it's important to reward and encourage the importance of that, just as it is important to identify the potential leaders that you can then develop and bring on uh, and develop as, as the organization develops. The final area which really sits behind the other four, and I think we've talked a little bit about already, is the, the data and insight. Um, effectively, it's, it's, uh, it's often said that you, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. And this is where the, the data and insight comes from. And, and we look to make sure that every decision that an organization makes and every proposal that we put to, to an organization is backed with some, some key data and some key insights. So we're not just going on gut instinct or gut, in, or gut feeling and what feels right, but actually on what would be a good return on the investment. Um, for that particular initiative. So, just moving this on a little bit further uh, and introducing something called indirect human capital management. I guess if we look at the two diagrams there, we look at 50 years ago, work was a, was a much simpler place in, in certain ways. Everything was made in-house, everything was done in the one place, you had control over everything, um, 
we can now see how in the 21st century organizations are much more complex often this is because it's uh, it's much easier people can can focus on what their core skills are what their core business is but it also makes it a little bit more complex towards the end of the 20th century that that was great because it was seen that the the, the head organization of a supply chain didn't have responsibility for that supply chain but these days more and more the public are demanding that no matter how complex a supply chain is how complex an organization is that ultimately it has to be responsible for all the people that are impacted upon it now that can be uh, it can be its own direct employees it can be indirect employees that are either fellow colleagues or employees that are in other organizations that are partners equally it can also be the impact that's made on 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 customers um, so it's about understanding that indirect human capital management the key areas on there is is really if you don't again going back to the data you've got possibly hundreds of thousands of people that are making things for you doing services for you talking about your business recommending you complaining about you that you really have no visibility over and no direct control over and this could cause tremendous damage to your brand and reputation now if we look at the positive side of that and you look at the impact your direct employees and your direct human capital has on your bottom line you now turn that on its head and if you look at if you develop transparency within your partners within your supply chain it gives you greater control and influence over those people it protects your organization and it provides an even greater opportunity to gain a competitive advantage from your from your supply chain and from your partners and I guess in an organization such as yourselves from your colleagues that work in different countries and you're working better together so we see that indirect human capital management is also the greatest area of competitive advantage for companies it, it's potentially for an organization such as yourself that doesn't have a, a very large supply chain as such but does have a very complex organization where there are relationships between the organizations and the different countries um, and, and obviously this is this is something that you as an organization are aware of by having webinars and, and sharing best practice in in situations such as this really so it's it's obviously something that you've, you've recognized and, and something that as an organization you do very well already so now going into a little bit more depth as to what human capital management services look like and how they can benefit an organization the first area we've talked about a lot we've talked about data and insight you can't really improve something unless you you know how good it currently is we have two approaches to that the first one is an assessment that's obviously a very broad based um, it's based upon an online or phone based assessment tool now the online assessment tool is something that we've developed from our, uh, ourselves it's a bespoke service it's very flexible um, it combines an ability to survey a broad amount of people from a very diverse either geographical range or organizational range but it can also take those surveys and combine them with the very specific metrics now those metrics can either be specific to a company itself so we can take the metrics such as turnover such as sickness days and we can link that and draw correlations between that and the surveys equally we can then overlay that with benchmark analysis so we can look at your turnover data and we can actually link that to in a particular country what's the what's the national average of turnover in that country so you can start to benchmark yourselves and see how good or how bad you are looking at things in a little bit more depth we also have our audit service and this really utilizes a more face-to-face -face approach and uses our network of highly experienced and qualified consultants it's a little more in depth so we tend to, to, to focus in on smaller samples but it helps us to fully investigate some root causes of identified issues um, quite often we will do an assessment first and that will allow us then to see the areas that we can focus in for for a particular audit but it really very much depends on the, the organization and, and the specifics of that organization if we then look at our next service 
really that comes under the banner of HCM consultancy services. And that effectively takes the data and the audit analysis that, we, that we've seen there and helps to turn that into insight. Um, we can then identify how, how good an organization is, where its good spots are, where its hot spots are, and really look to try and address those areas. Um, we try and take that data, develop the insight, then we look to propose positive uh, changes that you can make from that insight. We can also be on hand to help manage this change process and um, using the experience we've got of, of working with our previous customers to help the change process be as, as pain-free as possible and, and get the return on your investment as quickly as possible. Our other service really is uh, executive search. Um, this falls into two particular areas. Effectively, we can do our very short-term reactive service, which is very specifically um, to do with bespoke recruitment. We uh, work very closely with lots of FTSE 250 companies within the UK and also abroad. Some of the recent key appointments we've, we've been able to deliver for our customers, we've recently put in place a new chief exec for an international oil and gas producer. That oil and gas producer mainly has operations within the Kurdistan area, so it's not just UK based. Um, we've also put in place the chair and chief executive of a major UK sports agency as well. We branch out our executive search service to, to not only cover a very specific request, but also to look at organizations that appreciate that eventually, no matter how high up an organization, the person is always going to leave, whether they're going to retire, whether they're going to move on to a better job, whether they're going to move on to a different part of the organization. And it's important to really look at succession planning to make sure that an organization is not impacted by the, the movement of one particular person. Um, so we're able to, to work and develop a succession plan for you and to identify the, the talent within your organization that could step up uh, and fill any possible gaps and voids that occur. Now we get onto some more specific services around the people risk, and, and there are conflict management services. Effectively, this falls into two different areas. Investigations um, is very much about minimizing the damage of conflict. If I give you a statistic from the United Kingdom, the Confederation of British Industry estimates that it costs UK businesses £33 billion a year and takes up 20% of senior management time and loses potentially up to 370 million working days, all as a result of, of conflict within the workplace. Now, this is, is not only quite a significant cost, as you can see there, but it distracts a lot of people from what really should be uh, the core function of, of developing and growing a business. So the investigations part of that really is about minimizing the damage. It's about where something's gone wrong already, and it's about trying to put it, put it right as quickly as possible and to get to the, 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 the root cause of, of that particular issue. If we move over onto the right-hand column, we're really looking at mediation, and that's really about preventing any damage. Um, that's about getting in there before there's a, there's a major problem um, and, and really trying to, to, to nip any conflict in the bud. Now, this is obviously the area that we prefer to go to, uh, and, and the sooner that we're called in by our customers, the greater value we can provide. Because if we can get in there where there's a slight tension within an organization, perhaps between two work colleagues, we can very often prevent that escalating further, improve the relationships. So not only are we preventing significant cost, but we're also sometimes quite often increasing the productivity because we're getting rid of all that tension and we're getting increased team dynamics within a particular area. Finally, uh, if I look at the final service that we've got, um, it's really around our, our training and we train on, on human capital management services. Now, we can deliver training in a, a various series of ways. We can deliver it face-to-face. -face. Um, we also have web-based training. Um, the table on the left, that just gives you an example of some of the courses that we run as standard. 
Um, but we do, however, for our clients, provide bespoke training as well. So we can develop training that meets a customer's very specific needs. We also um, work in an area which uh, is, is slightly removed from training, but really is workplace coaching and counseling. Um, and that's on a more one-to-one -one basis. And that tends to be with senior management within an organization or people that have been identified as having the potential for, for further development. Often when we talk to organizations about one-to-one -one coaching for employees, it's often seen as something that addresses underperformance. Um, and that's certainly not the way we look at it. And if I, if I draw the analogy of, of sports, um, obviously I'm a big tennis fan, and if we look at tennis as an example, the top players in the world, the, the Roger Federer's and the Novak Djokovic's, they've reached a, a, an amazing level of performance already. But there's that desire to continuously push themselves forward and to continue to get better and better. And so that's why they have coaches. They have in a sports arena that to get peak performance, they need to be continuously coached. Now, too often within business, coaching is seen as something that just addresses underperformance and poor performance. One of the things we're finding that once a, once a customer really understands the, the, our ability to coach, um, and, and, and trust us to deliver that, they then really start to see the benefits and they start to see increased motivation in their staff and increased capability to do their job. Um, it, it's, it's really an area that started to grow and develop quite significantly. And really, that's, that's a, a, a very brief overview um, in terms of what we do. What I'd like to do now, and I've left quite a bit, bit of time to be able to do that, is really to take any of your questions that you've got around that or any of the wider areas around human capital management, if you either want to, to type them down to myself or Emma, um, and perhaps we can, we can respond to them. Does anybody have any questions for Craig? Um, I, I was just wondering, with um, on, on one of the slides you showed um, the um, 50 years ago and then now in the 21st century. Um, do you think that human capital will remain as important an asset considering you know, technology is progressing? Um, do you think it will remain important forever? It, it, it's, a, it's a very good question uh, and I, I think actually I, I'd go as far to say that it will become increasingly important. I think that there's a feeling that technology will play a larger part in organizations but, but I think we're finding that technology, it, it can be much easier copied. Um, so the competitive advantage of technology, you just have to look at, at, at something like smartphones where Apple had such a, a dominant position within smartphones, but you've got organizations such as Samsung and some of the Chinese companies that are really catching up fast because it's, it's very easy on technology to, to be able to understand something and to copy it and to, to equalize it. Mm -hmm. It's really, in terms of people, people are far more complex. Um, so when, when the competition increases and the margins of competition are, are much finer, then that extra one or two percent that you can get out of your people just makes such a significant difference, I think. Okay, yeah, uh-huh. And, and the other thing I was thinking is when you said about the, the ways that you actually assess um, the human capital, so the employees, um, do, you, do you take a sample or do you look at the whole organization, like when you're doing the surveys and, and that you said by telephone as well? So would you go through, like like for us, would you go through all 300 employees or, or do you, okay, no you take a sample? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we have the capability within, within our, our assessment. It, it's, it can be done either online or on the phone. Um, we have organizations that just ask us to do it in particular departments, but equally we have other organizations that, that you know, we can do it. I, I think we, the largest we've done so far is, is a, a workforce of 10,000. So we're pretty comfortable in doing that. One of the benefits we're finding, because we do a lot of pre-support and post-follow-up on our assessments, the, the actual response rate we get is around about the 70 to 80 percent, which um, normally when, when HR departments fill in surveys, we, we tend to find certainly in the UK that the, the response rates are around about the 30 to 40 percent. So I think by doing it as an outside organization, by the technology that we've got, it's very simple. Um, it's typically no more than 28 to 30 questions. Um, 
that allows it to be fairly quick and easy to use, but equally with the way that we're able to frame those questions, it still allows us to get quite a lot of information and, and then use the basis to perhaps go in and go a little bit more in-depth. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that. I have a, a question from one of the other sites. Um, they were saying, do you, do you think it's um, human capital, is it just as important for small companies as it is for larger companies? I mean, is, is this like a, 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 a broad statement for everybody or is this, you know, is it, do, do you look at certain companies and say, well, it's more important for medium sites or et cetera? I, I, I think we, I mean, we're finding, I, I speak, uh, I, I head up an organization where there are, there are 10 of us in an office um, and I, I find it's just as relevant um, to work within an organization this small as it is to work with some of our, our much larger customers. I, I think it really, there are, there are various different elements and if we start to look at the, that's why we break it down into the five factors. When you're a small organization, things like the people risk and the talent identification, they're, they're much less of an issue because you've obviously got a smaller workforce. Um, but there are the, the other areas that, that are much more important. I think it, it's those areas, um, the, the data and insights, sometimes in a small organization, you can go a lot on gut instinct where it's still there's data that you can pull out. Um, I think it's really about going into an organization and, and, and seeing how complex it is, not necessarily how it's not necessarily based on size, but more on complexity. Some some very small organizations can be very complex places. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, makes sense. Uh, does anyone else have any questions um, for Craig? I think you've uh, obviously with the presentation uh, answered most people's questions, Craig. So, um, thank you ever so much for today. And as I said, um, the video will be available online shortly and everybody will obviously receive the unedited version uh, in their mailbox. Um, so uh, if you have any questions for Craig, um, I know that your contact details are on there and then also in the bio that was sent out. So, um, Absolutely, yeah, very happy to take any questions at any stage. Okay, well thank you so much for your time Craig, really appreciate it and um, I know we'll talk again soon. Okay? That's great, thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye for now. Bye.